Is that recording? That is recording now. Okay, then I am going to, my video's on and my sound is on, my sound okay? Yes. All, All right. right. Thanks, Joe. So welcome, everybody, and we'll begin shortly. Thanks for coming.
Hello, I'm John Fisher, and this is Exercise. This is a story of San Francisco and Los Angeles. Now, I'm in the entertainment industry, and that means I'm in the theater industry, but it also means I'm in the bigger entertainment industry. And I always wanted to make it in movies. I wanted to make a big, huge Hollywood blockbuster, write it and direct it. And years ago, I had a show that did really well downtown. And a bunch of people from L.A. saw it, and they wanted to bring it to L.A. and do it in L.A. They wanted to do my show in L.A. And I thought, oh, my God, this is great. This is going to be my calling card to L.A. producers, to Hollywood producers. I'm going to break into the big time, into the movie business. I was so excited, and I was kind of intimidated by L.A. because L.A. was so rich, and that was the center of the movie industry. And every time I went down there, there was the flat part, but then there were the hills where all the rich and famous celebrities lived. There were the Hollywood Hills, Beverly Hills, and then, of course, Mulholland Drive. It was so exciting down there, and I was so intimidated by it. I thought it was so frightening. I used to drive around in the hills on days off when I was down there doing the show, looking for movie stars, looking for their houses, but I always saw these big walls and big hedges. I couldn't see any of the houses. And I realized that I was really kind of overwhelmed by LA, that maybe I thought too much about it. It, it. it sort of intimidated me, but not in a good way, not an inspiring way, but in a sort of overwhelming way. And then I felt like LA was sort of happening to me, as opposed to me happening to it. And that's when I had a thought about my own hill, the hill that I live on. And after my LA sojourn, I began to appreciate my little hill in San Francisco and everything that's here and all the rich history on it. And about eight years ago, I had some experiences that taught me a way to look way back on this older event and how not to let life happen to you, but make sure that you always happen to life. This is what happened to me about eight years ago. I was having a lot of things in my life where things weren't going so well. They were all kind of happening to me. Life kept happening to me. I was at school and teaching, and that was kind of happening to me all the time. I was doing these shows, but they're always kind of happening to me. I wasn't happening to them, they were happening to me. And then I was running the theater, but the theater didn't have any money. The theater was going through a really bad recession, right? The big recession. And it was happening to me. All these things were happening to me. And I decided I had to start happening in my life. And I had to figure out ways of happening to this life of mine. So how was I going to do that? I need to change something. Now, for years, I loved working south of Market Street in these very bohemian, grubby offices and horses spaces. I thought that was really cool. But I realized that that was sort of an old thought. And my new thought was I wanted to have a fancy office, something really swank. And the board and I figured out that if we spent the money in a special way, we could have, a, 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 we could have an office in a huge skyscraper. The thing was, is we were spending all this money on rehearsal space. If we took that money and combined it with the office space money, we would have enough money to rent a fancy schmancy office. And then we worked to deal with the people who rented us the office that we could rehearse at night in the communal boardroom. How exciting is that? So for the same amount of money, we got this office on the 32nd floor of this skyscraper and rehearsal space in the same office complex in the boardroom. Now here's the dope. It was one Samsung. How about that? A skyscraper downtown. And we had an office in it and rehearsal space. It was amazing. We were on the 32nd floor and had these really fast elevators that went boom, 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 boom. They used to scare people that moved so fast. And we would have rehearsals at night in this big boardroom. It was great. And the building was so tall that it creaked in the wind because it was rocking very gently from side to side. And the actors used to say to me, what is that creaking sound? And I said, that's the whole building rocking from side to side. Well, don't tell actors that. They don't like to hear that. They didn't like to hear the whole building was rocking side to side, although it was always safe. Now, this building, one stanza, is actually kind of famous. It's a famous building because it made an appearance in the last Godzilla movie in 2014. Now, here is Godzilla. This was a big Hollywood blockbuster. That's the 2014 Godzilla. Have you ever wondered why Godzilla, every time he turns up in a new movie every 10 years, he looks different? They redo him. Hollywood producers say, well, this is the anatomically correct Godzilla. This is authentic. Authentic? He's, he, he's Godzilla. He's made up. There's no Godzilla. It's not like a dinosaur or a dog. It, what? He's authentic. It's so weird. This movie's so funny, too, because 
about halfway through the movie, Godzilla starts crashing around in downtown San Francisco, and he comes right up to my building, and he goes, <laughs> and he destroys my building. And then five minutes later, not five minutes later, my building appears again. Isn't that great? And Godzilla <laughs> crashes it again. Isn't that wonderful? You sort of wonder where all this money goes in Hollywood. They spend all these money on movies, and they don't realize that they've smashed the same building twice and that Godzilla is looking different and then they explain it anatomically correct. This is weird. Hollywood is so strange. So I was happy. I had this great office. Then I wanted to do something else different. So my husband and I, who I adore, I've been with him forever. We decided to take a trip because we always have a great time on our trips. We go to exciting places and see all these great things. Unfortunately, what I love to do most on trips is eat. I eat all the time on trips. I have three big meals a day and seconds at all the meals and dessert after every meal, even breakfast. You know, when you stay in a hotel and they have a breakfast buffet, you can actually have a dessert after breakfast. It was amazing. I was having the best time on vacation because I was taking control of my life and I was eating tons of food, especially desserts. The only problem was I started out that year with a 32 inch waistline. And only six months into the year, my waist was 38 inches. I didn't even notice. It just suddenly happened. And I said to my husband, I said, why has Levi's added two loops on Levi's jeans? He said, because you're buying bigger jeans. They didn't add them to all the jeans. They just add them to your jeans because the waist is getting bigger. I didn't even notice. I was even buying new jeans and I didn't notice. Well, the only problem was, it sort of made me kind of like, ugh. you know, it just sort of weighed me down. I wasn't used to being a 38 and I was head towards 450. I don't know where. I wasn't used to it and it really weighed me down. So when we got back from the vacation, I decided it was time to start swimming. I had to find a pool and swim. And I'd swum in the pool at the Embarcadero YMCA. So I decided it was time to go down to the Embarcadero and get a membership. So I walked down Market Street. It was only about six blocks from that old office. And I've been there before swimming. Now, I have kind of a problem with gymnasiums. Not so much with gyms or pools, but with locker rooms. I am terrified of rock locker rooms. I was traumatized as a high school student. You see, when I was in freshman and a sophomore year of high school, I was forced to take PE and I didn't want to. I was this scrawny little kid. I was tiny, tiny. I'm out of the screen. I was so tiny. I was so tiny. And they made me take gym. And I was horrified to go into the locker room. So I got this huge t-shirt, you know, that went down my ankles, and I used to change like this into my gym shorts so nobody would see, so I nobody would see me naked or in my underpants. I was horrified, like anybody cared. But what scared me was there was all these big juniors and seniors walking around the locker room looking like a Rocky Balboa. They were tough. I was horrified of them. And then they expected us to take a shower. My gym teacher said, take a shower after every gym. After every gym, take a shower, otherwise you stink. I was, no way, no way was I going in that shower. That shower was horrifying. There were all these big naked guys in there and they were like adult shots, all rubbing themselves with soap and shouting at each other. It was incredible. I was gonna go in there, this little shrimp bowl. Can you imagine what they do to me? Well, I'm so vain. They wouldn't do anything, probably wouldn't even notice me. But what about me? Suppose I got overexcited, then what would happen? It's horrifying. So I had this complex about locker rooms because after sophomore year of high school, I never went into another one again because I was horrified of them. Decades passed, but now I wanted to swim at the YMCA. So I went in there and I said to the nice lady, could I have a membership? And she said, well, I want to give you a tour. I'll show you where the locker rooms are and the showers. I said, no, I don't want a tour. Uh, yeah, it's just a membership. And she said, but I need to give you a tour. And she said, I, I just want a membership. You see, I was afraid that if she showed me the locker rooms and the showers, I would freak out and not want to get a membership. I just wanted to get it and get in the pool. So she said, okay, we'll give you a membership. She gave me a membership. And then I said, okay, so uh, where do I change to go in the pool? She said, the locker room. I said, where's that? And she said, well, if you let me give you the tour, you would know. All right, all right. And uh, where, um, how do I get to the pool? And she said, well, if you let me give you the tour, you would know. She said, after you've been in the locker room, you walk through the showers. What? I can walk through the showers? Yeah, you walk through the showers to the pool. I thought, okay, where do I put my stuff? She said, well, if you let me give you the tour. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. you're such a nice lady. Where do I put my stuff? You put it in the locker in the locker room. The locker room is upstairs. So I started under the stairs. I was horrified. 
horrified of the locker room. And I went into the locker room. It was like it was like decades had not passed. And I was like, like squeezing into my swimsuit, hoping nobody would see me and pulling my shirt down to hide myself. I and mean, this is a fully, I mean, more than a fully grown man, like an extra fully grown man. Like trying, there's all these guys wandering around. It's probably the same guys, like 40 years later, right? Wandering around the locker room, looking around. So finally I'm in my swimsuit and I walked to the showers and I did not look. I just walked straight over the pool. I didn't look because I heard all this noise on the other side and all these guys were like rubbing themselves. It was like the nightmare from sophomore year in high school. But then I got into the pool, I dove in, and I started to swim. And it was magical. That first day, I swam 40 laps. It was the greatest thing ever. I loved it. I got the membership, I survived the locker room, the showers, and I was in the pool. Well, I don't want you to think that it was just swimming that attracted me to the Y. I also liked the weight room. Now, I can't do the weights now with COVID-19 because all the gyms are closed. So I've come up with all these things that I do in my hallway to make up for the weights that I'm not getting. And I'll show you. I'll show you what I do. So one of the things I do with the weights, it always helped me with my chest and my arm strength. So now I do a lot of push-ups in the hallway. Push-ups are great. They're the best thing for your arms and your chest. And I do this. I did them before the show tonight. I love doing push-ups now. And then I used to have this weight machine that helped me with my tummy. So now I do sit-ups. I hated sit-ups when I was a kid, but now I can do my sit-ups. Look at this. I love doing sit-ups. And I want you to know a secret. My stage manager taught me this. You don't have to go all the way down. And you don't have to touch your chin to your chest. That's great, because if you have to talk to a camera, it really helps your articulation to not have to touch your chin to your chest. And finally, I came up with these great push-ups with a chair that remind me of Rocky Balboa. Remember the movie Rocky? I do these things with a chair and I feel like Rocky. Suddenly I feel like I'm ready for the showers. These things are great. These are chair push-ups. And I'll do these. And I love these. I did 12 tonight. I could do these all the time. These are so much fun. My chair push-ups. Now, of course, you're wondering, how did I replace the swimming? Because there's no swimming pools open. How on earth did I replace the swimming? Well, what I replaced it with was aquatic park. Now, a lot of you know about this, the Dolphin Club. You can go swim in aquatic park. So I go down to aquatic park and I swim in San Francisco Bay. Now, the only challenge about aquatic park is that it's very, very cold. So this is what we're gonna do. I'm gonna go get dressed because we're gonna head out to explore my hill, the hill that got me over all the intimidation I felt about the Hollywood Hills, my hill right behind my own back house, my own backyard in San Francisco, California. We're gonna go out and explore the hill at night. This should be exciting. And I'll tell you why it's gonna be exciting. Because I haven't been out of this apartment at night since shelter in place for five months. This is my first time outside at night since shelter in place. How exciting is that? And you're talking about somebody who, because I was an actor, was out four or five times a week, six times to rehearse and things. I was out every single night and then suddenly never. So I'm gonna venture out into the darkness of San Francisco, the wild, wild west out there. And as part of this venture outside, exploring this wonderful hill that gave me confidence in San Francisco's hills to leave LA's intimidation behind, I'm gonna show you the walk o death. We're gonna go on the walk o death. This is the most exciting walk in San Francisco. It's extremely dangerous. And you're gonna be right there as I go on it for the first time in the darkness of night in San Francisco. Now I have to go change because I'm gonna show you what I also do exercise, which is bicycling. I have to get in the right outfit. And while I'm bicycling and getting changed in my bicycle gear, we're gonna show you a video which shows you the important things about swimming in San Francisco Bay. First of all, you have to remember that it's very, very cold. So you do jumping jacks before you go in to get your blood pumping. Then you just dive in. And when you dive in, your body's in shock because it's so cold, but you have to remember to breathe. If you remember to breathe, you won't panic. If you forget to breathe, you don't have oxygen and you panic and you might die. Also, in San Francisco Bay, at Aquatic Park, there are harbor seals. Now harbor seals are pretty much okay, but they are marine animals. And they can be vicious. Four years ago, they started biting people, but something was wrong with them four years ago. They haven't been biting people lately. And you see them out there, right? 
So you just have to remember that while you're swimming, don't accidentally bash one in the head. Very dangerous. And finally, very important, you have to remember to frolic. Because after you've done all that exercise, you have to remember to splash around in the water. That's your tribute to Neptune, the water god, frolicking in his water. So the wonderful Joe Talley is going to show you a video about getting into the water, remembering to breathe. He's going to show you a vicious looking harbor seal, so you'll know what to look for, this little head that you'll see. And then he'll show you my demonstration of frolicking. So let's turn it over to the wonderful Joe Talley. Take it away, Joe, as I go change. I'll be back. Okay, everyone, that was John swimming out, and then he encountered a vicious looking seal. Ooh. That's it. That's the vicious looking seal. But you're going to be happy to know John survived. John survived, no seal. How about that? Thank you so much, Joe. We're back. Yes, did you see that vicious looking seal? Wasn't that intimidating, that little black dot? He looked vicious. Did you see me frolicking at the end? You have to remember to frolic. It's very important. So I just want to make sure that I'm all oriented right. Yes, indeed. And let's try one more thing before we go. Perfect. There we go. It looks like we're all set. Now you see, I've gotten into my bicycling outfit. I never wear these things. I think they look totally silly, but I love this one. This is the first one I've ever owned. I got it because I knew that you'd expect a costume. So I got a great deal on Amazon Prime and it arrived. And it's black and it's red. Those are very theatrical colors. And now I have my great bicycle outfit. I think guys that wear these are silly because they're so tight. And I don't think tight clothes should be worn on a bike. But most people disagree with me. So I wore it for you so that I have a costume. Now I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna discover this hill behind my, my house. 
and it's going to show you that this hill can rival any Hollywood or Beverly Hill for celebrities, for important literary people, for politicians, and for musicians. It's an amazing hill. And it got me over my intimidation with Hollywood and the whole film industry and those magical hills behind Los Angeles. But I want to be safe tonight. I want to be very, very safe. So here are my safety procedures. I'm going to take my backpack because it has my wallet in it. That way, if anything happens to me, the paramedics can do a lot of biopsy. That's what they call it. They find out who I am for my driver's license, but more important, they find my insurance card and they won't help you unless you've got an insurance card. So now I'm set. I'm also going to take my headset so you can hear me talk better. There I am with my headset. It's got a microphone in it. Also, I'm going to wear my COVID-19 mask. Now I don't have COVID-19, but I don't want anybody to give it to me. And I might have it secretly, but I don't think I do. Anyway, I want to be safe and sure. So I'm going to wear my COVID-19 mask. How about that? Also, I'm going to take my keys because I've got a husband. I've had him for decades and decades and decades. I want to make sure that he's locked up in this apartment so nobody can come in here and grab him. I'd hate to lose him because he is the best. And finally, I'm going to wear my helmet. Now, my friend in high school, her mother used to say to us, anytime we left the house when we were going to go biking and we didn't have helmets on, She'd say, why aren't you wearing helmets? And we'd say, well, we just don't want to. And she said, how nice of you to donate your organs to people who need new organs and to science. Because when you fall off your bike and bust up your head, that's what's going to happen to your organs. You'll be organ donors. That's so nice of you too. I don't want to be an organ donor. Not at all. I don't like donating organs. So I'm going to hang on to them as long as possible by wearing a helmet. Now, later tonight, we'll be going on a walk o death. This should be truly terrifying and the first time I've ever done this in my life. So now let's plug in so that you can hear me. So now we're plugged in and I hope you can hear me through my microphone. Now I'm going to take you off of the wall and I'm going to put you onto my bicycle and we're going to head out into the night. Now you're off the wall. And here you go to my bicycle. There you are. You're attached to my bike. Isn't this fun? Now, I'm going to turn on my lights for night safety. Do you see it blinking? Do you see it blinking? It's my front light. And I have a backlight, which blinks red. Well, I think we're all set to go. Let's go see what we can find on my big hill. And does it rival a good old Hollywood hill? Let's try it. So we're headed out the door, and now we're going out into the wilds of San Francisco for the first time since shelter in place. It's been five months that I've been inside at night. I haven't been out at night at all. This will be exciting. We're now in my hallway at night. This is my hallway. Now let me pause here and get my keys so I can lock my husband into the apartment. Now I know that doesn't sound very PC, locking up your husband but he's a terrific husband and I'd hate for somebody to come by and grab him. So he's getting locked up. He's all locked in. So now let's go outside. This is exciting. Now this is the lobby of my building. This building was built by James Dunn in 1904. So it went through the 1906 earthquake and the Loma Prieta earthquake in 1989. It didn't show any external damage, but I'm standing on the carpet now in the hallway and I can feel a crack in the floor under my feet. Now let's go outside. And if I move too fast for the video, it might jump ahead, but don't get impatient. I'll pop back up again, right? You know, internet and all that stuff, Wi-Fi. So here we go outside into the night. The thing I love about the architect James Dunn is he has the same name as a high school buddy of mine, Jamie Dunn. Jamie Dunn was the first architect I knew. He built all of the sets for the plays that I was in in high school, and he was so talented. What a coincidence, the same name as James Dunn who built this building in 1904. So let's go down the stairs here, and I'll show you the first cool thing about this building. We're going out my front gate, and there, look above me. Do you see right behind my head? Right behind my head. Yes, a head. 
another face. Isn't that fun? It's green now, but it used to be white, like a Baudillion face, and had blush and rouge and eyeshadow because it was painted in the 60s during the summer of love. Isn't that exciting? And look at my great gate in front of the building. What fun. Now let's go across the street and we'll get a better look at my building. You see it soaring up above me? Look at those columns. That's what he was famous for. The grand order, the giant order, big, huge gestures. And then look at those scrolls on either side of the head. He always used mannerist design. Big, big, big. That was James Dunn, the architect. So let's go across the street and look back at my building and get a better view of it. I love this building. He's my favorite San Francisco architect. So we're gonna turn it around and get a quick peek at my building. There it is. How much fun is that? Look at that. There's the giant order soaring up above. He's famous for the giant order, the big scrolls, and the rusticated base. Now let's look at my place. There it is. It's that with window right there. Now let's zoom in and I'll show you something fun. Look above my window. Look at that. There's another face. I've got my own face above the window. Not painted vaudeville anymore, but green. I love it. What a great building. The Haight-Ashbury is full of all sorts of terrific buildings, and they survived redevelopment because for so long nobody wanted them. Okay, here we go. Now we're going to head down to Haight Street, the bloodline, the lifeline of the Haight-Ashbury. This is Haight Street right in front of me. One of the most famous streets in the world. How exciting is that? Now, we're going to cross the street and look at some really terrific buildings. These all on There are seven of them marching down the street. They were designed by a great architect named Daniel. Here we go. We're going to head up this big hill in front of me, across the street. Now in front of me, you see a park. That is Buena Vista Park. It used to be called Hill Park, and that is the first park in San Francisco, and was designed by a great landscape architect, yes, John McLaren. He came here to make Golden Gate Park, and while he was at it, he made Buena Vista Park in 1867, the first park in San Francisco. It was sort of a gift with purchase because it was a small park to accompany his big park, Golden Gate Park. It's so mysterious at night. Look at it, soaring in front of us. And later, we're gonna enter the park at night on the Walk O Death. Why is it the Walk O Death? I'll tell you, it's scary. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. Now this in front of us is Walden House. Walden House is for people going through recovery. Recovery from drugs, recovery from alcohol, people with psychological problems, people re-entering the real world, in quotes, after they got out of jail. It's a wonderful place full of terrific people. And it's part of an organization called Health Right. I'll tell you that about that in a minute. Now, there you see, Buena Vista Park. Buena Vista Park has storm drains that are lined with old headstones from graves. The graves were removed from Lone Mountain, which is off to our right, because they wanted to build a college there. And nobody claimed the gravestones. They moved the bodies, but not the stones. So they used the stones to line the storm drains. Now look at this. This is the chapel at the back of Walden House because it used to be a Christian organization. What was it before it was Walden House? Well, I'll tell you, it was what was known as a home for fallen women. Yes, that was the awful name they called them. Women who got pregnant, who didn't have a husband. They'd come here 
have their babies, and the babies would be adopted. In that way, nobody would know. How awful. Walden House is run by an organization called Health Right, the right to health. That started with the Hate ashbury Free Clinic because a doctor in the 60s thought that everybody should have health care. He thought health care was a right, not a privilege. So he started the Hate ashbury Free Clinic and added to that organization, Health Right is Walden House, this terrific organization for recovery and re-entering the real world, in quotes. We're now headed up Buena Vista West. So, getting back to my story about LA, some people I met in San Francisco loved the show and they wanted to perform it in LA. They asked me if I'd let them do it. They even auditioned for me and they were terrific performers. So I took them and I combined them with a bunch of actors who've been in the show in San Francisco, but were already living in LA because they wanted to make it in movies and TV. And some of them have. And I headed down there one summer long ago to direct the show. I was gonna use it as my calling card to become a film director, a writer and director of Hollywood movies. Let's go up the steps here. Now I'll give you some clues as to who the occupants are of the first two houses that we're gonna visit. Their songs, listen carefully. Driving that train, high on cocaine. Here's another one. Teach your children well, their father's hell will slowly go by. So treat. And here's another song. Don't worry, happy. Those are the clues. This first house we're stopping at is 737 Buena Vista West. There it is. What a majestic house undergoing yet another renovation. I love it. Now this house was built by a man named Vogel in 1897. He built it for a man named Richard Spreckles. Spreckles was the nephew of Klaus Spreckles, the sugar baron. Now Klaus Spreckles built the first Spreckles mansion in Pacific Heights. It's based on the Petit Trianal from Versailles. And his nephew Richard wanted his own mansion, so he built this Spreckles mansion on my hillside with a spectacular view of the Pacific Ocean. Look at that building. Well, Richard Speckles moved on, and then it became a boarding house, and a very interesting man moved into it, Ambrose Bierce. Yes, the great American author of The Devil's Dictionary. Ambrose Bierce is one of my favorites. He is amazing. When he was a child, he became a drummer boy in the Union Army during the Civil War. He fought in many great battles, and when he got out of the Union Army, he was a brevet major. He wrote a terrific story about one of those battles, Chickamauga, and the best story about war ever, the incident at Owl Creek Bridge. I love this story because it plays with the time-space continuum. It is a terrific story, one of the best about war ever, ever, ever. Then he moved to San Francisco to write for William Randolph Hearst's San Francisco Examiner, and he wrote a poem two and a half months before the assassination of President McCoy. Well, the poem satirized assassins, and people thought that he had incited the assassin. How stupid. Ambrose Bierce never took anything seriously because he thought that men were awful. He thought that man was a wolf to man. And that's a very important phrase given what we're going to do tonight. Man is a wolf to man. He wrote about true crime, and what he hated was the temporary insanity plea. It was awful. A man pushes his wife out the window, she dies in the fall, and he says he was temporarily insane. How stupid. Ambrose Beer said they should make temporary insanity a hanging offense, a capital offense. Only then people wouldn't use it. So he moved out, but he recommended the top floor to a friend of his, Jack London. And in 1906, Jack went way up there to the top floor. There you can see it. And he wrote the best book ever, White Fang. This book is amazing. It is better than Call the Wild. If you haven't read this book, it's a page turn and was written right there at the top of this house. Just read it tonight. You must read this book tonight, White Fang. Just read page turn and suspense there on that top floor. Look at it, look at it, look at it, look at it. It is amazing. Now Jack London did something else really cool. He went to Hawaii and he discovered surfing. He was the first Howie to fall in love with surfing. So now when you see how we surf, it's because of Jack London. 
Many years passed after Jack London, and a man named Jerry Garcia came here with a band called The Grateful Dead. They went back up to where Jack London had written his book, and on the top floor, they started recording the first tracks they ever recorded, right here in the Haight-Ashbury in this building, 737, built in 1897. How amazing is that? Unfortunately, Jerry and his band members didn't like hauling their stuff all the way up the stairs, so they didn't record that much stuff up there. So a few years passed, and then an incredible actor bought this house, a real Hollywood movie star. And here I am intimidated by the Hollywood Hills, and I have a movie star right here in this house. It was bought by none other than Danny Glover. How about that? Danny Glover, a local hero. He was a member of the San Francisco crime troupe before he became a movie star. And he moved into this house because he loved it. He loved to be in San Francisco. So he lived in this house for a while. Then he divorced his wife, and she lived in it for another 15 years. And then, finally, she sold it recently. Sold for $10 million. Now, I wonder who's going to move into it now. Somebody great, I bet. So the next house is right next door. This is an amazing house. Because of the people who've lived in it. Let me guess who the people are. Here we are at 731 Buena Vista. The house right next door to Danny Glover's. Let's zoom in. There. Can you see it? The grilled entryway. You can just make it out. It's amazing. It's like the entryway to a house that the Adams family would own. Morticia and Gomez. Look at that entryway. This house was built in 1904. How much, much later. Of Crosby, Crosby says, how wonderful to teach your children well. One of my favorites. Now, he bought this house and refurbished it and commissioned that great grilled entrance. Look at that wonderful entrance. He commissioned it for the love of his life, Joni Mitchell. Well, unfortunately, Joni Mitchell never lived there because they broke up before she could get in there. So, Graham Nash moved on to the next love of his life, Rita Coolidge. I don't know if she lived in this house, but how fun that Graham Nash from England lived in the Haight-Ashbury and built that great grill. Then he sold it, and a man named Bobby McFerrin bought this house. How fun is that? How, how does Hollywood Hills have this hill beat? This is just one of dozens of hills in San Francisco, and look at everybody on it. Now, Bobby McFerrin wrote that great song, Don't Worry, Be Happy. And in that great song, he used two of his friends from the Bay Area. He used that great clown, Bill Irwin, of the Pickle Family Circus, and my favorite physical comedian from my lifetime, Robin Williams, a local hero. Robin Williams from Marin County. He went to my high school, Redwood High School, and they're all in his video. And they live right next door to Danny Glover's house from the SF Mine Troop. I'll tell you something else about Danny Glover. He's a great recycler, good guy. He used to haul his recycling down to Golden Gate Park, but now that recycling place is gone. How exciting is that? Now let's keep moving up the hill. Now I'm gonna show you a bunch of houses, which are all the same. People don't know this. A developer developed this gray house behind the pole and this tan house up the hill with the lights on and then the gray house next to it and the next gray house across the street from that. They're all exactly the same house, but with different decorations and different paint jobs, they've come to look completely different. So let's head further up the hill. Now it's kind of foggy, so you can't see it. But if you look across, you'll see vaguely in the fog, another mountainside. That's the opposite side. It's way over there. It's pretty hard to see. But on that mountainside is a street called Edgewood. Edgewood is on that mountainside. And that Edgewood is the location of my next story. Because on Edgewood lives one of the great gay writers of all time maybe one of the great writers of all time, an amazing man, an amazing San Franciscan, Armistead Maupin. Now, he is related to my hill through a very special way. And I'm gonna tell you what that is as we approach the next big apartment building. But let's stop here for a second, because this is amazing. Right here, if you look across the street, you're gonna see a series of houses, beginning with this gray house. One of the houses, that was the same, the gray house, then another classical house, then sort of a Dutch inspired Victorian house, 
then an ultra contemporary house, a wonderful Queen Anne house. This is beautiful. You've got to see the paint job on this. And across the street from this, a famous Henry Hill house, a classic modernist house. All these houses from different eras sharing the same half block, and they're all very happy with each other. Isn't that great? Up on top of a mountainside. What a great hill I live on. Look at that. Teeth by jowl, and they're all different. That's what I love about San Francisco, diversity. Everybody very different, working together, like the houses. Now, Armistead Maupin was for many years with a boyfriend that he loved dearly. But during the AIDS crisis, they were under a lot of stress, and eventually they broke up. As a result, his boyfriend, who he loved very dearly, he still moved out. And that's the next story. But before we do that, we're going to take a mini walk o death. We're going to turn left here and enter the park. We are now entering Buena Vista Park after dark. How scary is this? Now, I'll tell you why I keep saying this is a walk o death. Because the 80s, this park was known as Skinhead Park. It was full of skinheads. There were so many skinheads here that it became internationally famous. Tourists used to come here just to see the skinheads, but I wouldn't recommend it because the skinheads were not nice. They could be vicious. Once CBS News came here because they wanted to make an interview of the skinheads and the skinheads attacked the newsmen. I thought newsmen were sacrosanct. They attacked them. They grabbed their cameras and they chase them out of Buena Vista Park. So here we are on the mini walk of death, and at any minute, a very old skinhead could attack us. There could be skinheads still here from 1987. Imagine, and they're probably angrier than they were back then. That is why this is the mini walk of death, to give you a preview of the big walk of death. Now we all love Italian hill towns. Who doesn't love Italian hill towns? like Orvieto and San Gimignano. But look at this, in the middle of San Francisco, look at this. We have our own Italian hill town. Can you see it? There it is, right in front of us. There is San Ignatius, built in 1914. How about that? And right behind it, Lone Mountain College, built in 1922. And if you look really close, you can see the Golden Gate Bridge behind Lone Mountain College. Look at that. An Italian hill town in the middle of San Francisco. Woohoo! Now, most Italian hill towns took hundreds of years to form through the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. It took them that long in Italy to make an Italian hill town. But we have an Italian hill town in the middle of San Francisco, and it only took two years to build. Isn't that amazing? Look at that. An Italian hill town. I'm so proud of San Francisco's ingenuity. Aren't they the best? San Ignatius is a Catholic cathedral built in 1914, and Lone Mountain College is a Catholic university run by the Jesuits for women. USF, which is between the two, is a Catholic university for everybody. But now it's all co-ed. They've broken all that up. So those distinctions don't apply anymore. There you saw it, the Italian hill town in the middle of San Francisco. How much fun. Now we're headed back down. Now, Armistead has written many famous books. His most famous series, of course, being Tales of the City. But my favorite book of Armistead Maupin's isn't Tales of the City, it's The Night Listener. It's amazing. It's almost as good as White Fang. It's all about a man who longs for his boyfriend because they broke up. But it's also a romance because he's discovering somebody new. And it's also a mystery and a thriller. It is the best book ever. Love it, love it, love it. And in that book, every night, he's in his house in Edgewood. It's pretty much an autobiographical novel. And he goes to the window of his house in Edgewood. And he looks across the valley towards my mountain, Buena Vista Mountain. And he looks towards an apartment building. Why is he looking towards an apartment building? because that's the apartment building where his ex-lover is living. And here it is in the flesh, described in the book, this magnificent 
skyscraper apartment building built in 1924 by J.C. Bauman. Look at that on top of my hill. I love it. And look at closely because what this building is famous for are its huge windows, loft style windows like you see in New York City. How exciting is that? These big, huge windows. And I wonder if Armistead Maupin, with all of his money, deliberately bought a condo for his ex lover with big windows so that he could look across the valley from Edgewood and spy on his ex lover, make sure that his ex lover didn't have any current lovers. He does that in the book. He looks across through binoculars, hoping to see his ex lover. I love this building. Now look at this entrance. This is the entrance to the building. It's really spectacular. The architecture is Shirigaresque. Shirigaresque is an exaggerated Baroque architecture stolen from the Spanish of the 17th century. Right here, built in the 1920s in the middle of San Francisco. What a talented architect J.C. Bauman was. And still in that building is Armistead's ex. Years ago, we put on a play version of one of Armistead Maupin's very few short stories. It's called Almost Home. It's heartbreaking. It's about Armistead and the ex-lover struggling with AIDS. It's incredible. And in it, they're still together. Well, we put the show on at the theater and the ex-lover called me up and said, hey, I'm that guy in the story. I live in that building. I live on the same hill you do. Isn't that fun? So now we're approaching the top of the roadway. On your left, I'm gonna show us something which we're gonna visit later tonight. Meanwhile, in LA, we were down there rehearsing away, having a great time, and we had to get some money. The money had been promised by a big Hollywood producer, $5,000 for marketing, but he hadn't given it to us yet. So we called him up to ask for the money. Now look at this. This is in front of us, the Walk O Death. That is the trail that leads to the top of Buena Vista Park. How exciting is that? And when we finished our next venture, we're going to go to the top of Buena Vista Park in the dark at night, the Walk O Death. Who knows what we'll find up there? So he said, Come on up to my house. I want to talk to you guys. He had a big house in the Hollywood Hills. I was excited. I was going to a producer's house in the Hollywood Hills. As we go down this street, we pass a beautiful house built by Ida McCain, one of the few female architects from the early 20th century. It was built in 1917, and it is a pip. I love this house. It's made of clinker brick, you know, those uneven bricks. Let's look at this. How about that? Look at those bricks, all that beautiful red. I love this house, it's majestic. Let's look up at the top. Look at the roof line. This house is great. Let's go down a little ways and we'll double back on it. Can you imagine in 1917, what gracious gods hired a woman and then they trusted her to do what she thought was best. And she created the best house on the top of Buena Vista Park. Look at this. I just love this entry. Look at that. Isn't that just something out of a fairy tale? I love it. And look at the grounds in front. So beautifully done. These very nice gay men own this house. And every year they decorate for the holidays. Every single holiday, their front yard different. Ida McCain, one of the few female architects working in San Francisco in 1917. She has houses in other neighborhoods like in the Richmond, but this next house is the home of a very important man. I love this guy. He's great. In 2003, he was elected mayor of San Francisco. And in 2004, 11 days into his first term, he started, he started marrying but he said, so long as I'm there at the city level. So he started marrying those people. And here is his house. Yes, indeed. This is the house of Gavin Newsom. This is where he lived when he was mayor. Isn't that spectacular? And he just kept marrying people. They kept telling him that he couldn't, and he just kept doing it. He married them, he married them, he married them. 
And eventually, because he married people for 10 years, they had to make it legal. Now, it had to happen because a lot of gay representatives like Barney Frank said, no, 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 it's too early. But Gavin said, no, 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 it's much too late. Let's do it. And I'm convinced that he got marriage for me and Michael. I wouldn't be married to my wonderful husband if it weren't Gavin. Now, he lived in this house with his wife, Jennifer Seibel. Jennifer Seibel is from my hometown, Ross, Ross, California, in Marin County. And I knew a Seibel. I don't think it was her, but I knew another Seibel. So all these great things come from Ross, right? Yay! Jennifer Seibel. After he was independent governor of California, he built a house on his mother and father in law's estate. And that's where the Newsoms ended up. Isn't that exciting? And they have children. I'm convinced that he's going to become the first president who's gay. That's right. I mean, he loves his wife and his kids. But I think once he's president, he's going to come out of the closet. He's done so good stuff for gay people. I'm proud of Gavin. Now, Right in front of us, you see the silhouette of a great hill. This is called Corona Heights. Now, if you have Corona Heights, I definitely recommend it. It is a pip. It's right there. There, you see it? That's the top of Corona Heights. Get over here so you can see the tip top. Sometimes you can see, oh, there's a person. You can see a person's silhouette. You can see a person silhouette on the top of Corona Heights. And you get an incredible view of the Castro, with the big Castro Theater sign looming in the foreground. So now we're going to go down the street, which is named after Franklin Roosevelt. It is another movie star's house. Amazing, isn't it? Here I was thinking that the Hollywood Hills had all the movie stars, but this is another one. First we had Danny Glover, but this one, this one is huge. She was one of the biggest movie stars of all time. Certainly the biggest movie star of her time. She was incredible. And she loved to have houses in different cities. So she came to San Francisco and she built herself a Hollywood mansion in the hills. Isn't that exciting? And here it is coming up right in front of us. You can see it with the columns. Yes, it's a mini mansion. It's a mini Hollywood mansion on the top of my hill. Look at that. It's like we're in Beverly Hills. Look at that. Do you see it? Those are ionic columns. As I said, it's like a mini mansion. I love it. It's only one story tall. Whoever. Her name was... Norma Talmadge, and she was the star of the silent screen. Everybody loved Norma Talmadge. And she built this house because she loved San Francisco, and she loved to hang out in San Francisco on my hill. Now, I hope you can see that she was also very practical because all of her doors and windows, she has bars. She realized that she was in the middle of San Francisco, and she had to be safe. So she put bars on the windows. Let's go have a closer look, and hopefully we won't get in trouble for disturbing the occupants. I love this house. It's magical. And out the back of it, it's got an amazing view. How about this? There it is, your mini mansion in San Francisco. Now, it's not just a mini mansion because they found out that there's a ballroom on one of the lower floors. There are three floors that go down the hill and the ballroom had a full-size Steinway Grand in it. And when she died, they had to take that out. Now, Norma Talmadge was very famous, and she made the transition to sound. She did. She had a good speaking voice. She worked on it a lot. And you can watch all of her movies on YouTube for free, the silent ones and the sound one. And her voice is really good. But the two movies she made with sound were not good movies. They were terrible. And consequently, her career ended, and she retired. And people used to say she was killed by sound, but she wasn't killed by sound. It wasn't her fault. 
they were just awful movies. That's what killed her. Unfortunately, she was the inspiration for Lena Lamont, that character who can't speak, who can't make the transition from silence to talkies in the movie Singing in the Rain. Isn't that awful? And even worse, Billy Wilder said that Norma Talmadge, inspiration for Norma Desmond in Sunset Boulevard. Horrifying. Can you imagine being the inspiration for Norma Desmond? That's terrible. Unfortunately, there's some truth in it because she became a big drug addict after she retired. She had a lot of pain from arthritis. There's Corona Heights, and you can see somebody right there in the saddle of the two peaks. How much fun is that? As I said, go up there and get the great view of the Castro and downtown San Francisco. Well, Norma Talmadge had a very pushy mother named Meg, Peg Talmadge. Peg was determined to make all of her children, her three daughters, movie stars because she married a bad husband who was a drunk. And she did. And she invested all their money and they all lived glorious retirements. But she did do a lot of drugs and unfortunately became an inspiration for Mary Desmond. But we like our house, right? So as you see now, we're approaching once again the walk of death. And if for chance you don't think I'm serious about this being a dangerous walk, I'm going to show you something. Because right at the entrance to the walk of death is a sign. Oh, there's another great view. Look at that. Can you see it? There it is at the end of the street. There it is, the Italian hilltop in the middle of San Francisco. Yes, indeed. San Ignatius. I gave us, it took the Italians hundreds of years to make this Italian hilltop. It took us only 10. So, here we come up to the entrance to the Walk O Death. And here, at the entrance, is a sign. And the sign says, this was a problem. And it started about five years ago. Look at this sign. How scary is that? See what it says? Coyote alert. Coyote alert. Five years ago, coyotes suddenly turned up in Buena Vista Park. Right here in Buena Vista Park. Coyotes. How scary is that? Now, the reason there's a coyote alert is because the coyotes started eating small animals. People would bring their dogs up here, but they wouldn't have them on a leash, and the coyotes would grab the dogs. Well, now people have gotten smart about the dogs on leashes, right? So that's okay, but the coyotes are hungry, and maybe they're going to attack us. Additionally, there could be skinheads left over from 1987 up here still. Yeah, so that's dangerous too. Also, there are predatory gay men looking for sex. They come up here from the Castro. How scary is that? Predatory gay men looking for sex? That could be very dangerous. And a recent development is nice middle-class people have been coming up here during COVID-19 and they've been ignoring the laws about open containers. They've been coming up here to drink wine. And what happens to nice middle class people when they've had too much Chardonnay? I don't know, but we could be attacked by COVID-19 nice middle class people drunk on too much Chardonnay and Chablis. So this is truly the walk o death. We're heading up the hill now, back to Los Angeles. We went to talk to our producer in this beautiful house in the Hollywood Hills. It was spectacular. It's right next to where the Getty is now. And he told us where because he said if you park in the right spot, it might look like a dirt spot, but it also might have a septic tank under it. And if you park in that wrong spot, your car could end up in a lot of poop. We got into his apartment. I mean, his house. It was a spectacular house with a great view. Got into it and we asked, can we have the money, the $5,000 for marketing? He said no. He wasn't going to give it to us. He didn't know anything about theater. So he didn't want to run the risk 
a bluesy is five thousand dollars on a theater investment. What a disappointment! So we said, because we wanted to stay nice, we said, "Could you do something else for us?" He said, "Sure," because he felt bad. He said, "Can we build our set in your garage?" And he said, "Yeah, great." So we arrived in an agreement. Here we are at the top of Buena Vista Park at the end of the walk o deck. Amazing. And I don't see any nice middle class people drunk on open container wine, Chablis and Chardonnay. No skinheads left over from the 1987. No cuts and no predatory gay men looking for sex. It's completely safe. How fun is that? And yet another great view through the trees of that magnificent Italian hill town. There it is. San Ignatius, San Francisco's glowing hill town in the middle of the city. And over here, if you look closely, you can see the Golden Gate Bridge. Well, there's nothing like that in Los Angeles. Uh, no Golden Gate Bridge and no Italian hill town like San Gimignano. There's a lovely little plaque right here, and you probably won't see it because it's so dark, but I'm gonna stop and look at it. This plaque is wonderful because it's a tribute to the children who help keep this park going. They come up here, maybe you can see it in my blinking light, probably not. Anyway, it's a plaque thanking them for all the hard work they do, preserving Buena Vista Park. See, the problem with Buena Vista Park is that it's a huge sand dune, and it's always trying to wash away, taking all the trees with it. Look at this. This is a wild park. It's almost completely undesigned. It's just crazy. It's a rustic, wonderful nightmare. I love it. And here we are on the Waco deck. So this rich Hollywood producer had agreed to let us build a set in his garage. Well, I think he thought it'd take us a weekend, but we showed up with 20 actors and technicians we spent three weeks building the set in his garage. That was our revenge. We wouldn't go away. And his very nice wife had to move her Jaguar out of the garage. And after three weeks of hammering and painting all day on the weekends, he told us, could you please move your set out of my garage? He was very nice. And we said yes, because it was almost opening night. So it all worked out fine. And we were able to be just a little bit annoying to this guy. Now, if you look in front of us, you'll see Twin Peaks with all the little houses. Do you see it? It's just visible there. There it is. Twin Peaks with all the little houses. With all the little houses, it's full of gay men, of course. So it's often called the Swish Alps. Anyway, our Hollywood producer couldn't afford to give us $5,000. I never figured that one out. I didn't figure it out, or I couldn't because he'd given $20 million to make the movie Hurricane. Yes, indeed, he paid for half of it. Now this guy had made a bunch of money in Canada by deforesting Canada. His family was responsible for a Canadian logging empire. That's how he made his money, by deforesting Canada. And he had gave $20 million to make the movie Hurricane, starring Denzel Washington. What a great movie. Now, the movie came out about a year after our show, and Denzel was great. He got an Academy Award nomination. They also had to pay for a very fancy director, Norman Jewison. And they also had to pay Bob Dylan to use the rights to his song, The Hurricane. Of course, he had to do that. That's almost as famous as the movie. Probably more so. And consequently, they... spent all, all of their money. All it was, the movie was a big hit, got tons of money. So our producer got fleeced, fleeced by Denzel, Norman Jewison, and Bob Dylan. But I say more power to them. Artists should always be paid as much money as possible, even if producers, especially that producer, lose money. Well, he's still down there, so I tried to remain friendly. Maybe one day he'll hire me to write and direct a movie. I gave him a, a flower on opening night with his wife. He was so surprised and touched. I said, thank you for letting us build the set in your house, in your garage. 
Now, coming up on the right is where I want to retire. Of course, I'm never going to retire because uh, I'm going to have to work until just before I die. But that's okay. I'll have two or three months of retirement. And where I want to retire is here at Buena Vista Manor House. I love this place. Look at it. It's at the top of my hill. And it's got the best tile work ever. Look at that facade. Now, let's see if we can see the tile work. Yes, there it is. Buena Vista Manor House. Isn't it? Cute. I love this place. Now, I think it might be a bit of a challenge for retirees because um, you're not going to want to be at the top of a hill if you're retired. You can't really walk anywhere. But that's okay. When I retire for two months before I die, I don't want to walk anywhere. I just want to watch TV and eat a lot. Yeah, remember eating? I love to eat. In front of me, and you can always see it through the windows, you see the windows of a hospital. This was a hospital. It was called St. Joseph's. It was a Catholic hospital. And right now, you can't see it, but it used to be, and still is, pink. It was always pink. But that's not because it's above the Castro. It's because that was its color. After it was St. Joseph's Hospital, it became a psychiatric hospital, even though it has a chapel on the back of it. So it went from worshiping God to worshiping Sigmund Freud. Fascinating. And this hospital is famous because it made a cameo appearance in the greatest San Francisco movie ever. Maybe the greatest movie of all time. Because when it was a psychiatric hospital, somebody came here to be crazy. And that person who came here to be crazy was none other than Jimmy Stewart in Vertigo. And he's shown going in and out of this great hospital because he was crazy in love with blonde Kim Novak. Yes, it made an appearance in the greatest movie of all time. Now, as we go down the hill, you'll see the spectacular view that Norma Talmadge and the people in this hospital, it's now a condo building, and also anybody up here has if they face this direction. If you look off there in the distance, just above that peaked roof, you'll see downtown San Francisco with all the skyscrapers lit up. How about that? Now, the skyscrapers flash different colors. It's an imitation of the Chinese city of Sechen and also the Chinese city Hong Kong. Well, the flashing isn't quite as spectacular as it is in Sechen in Hong Kong, but then those skyscrapers are in the middle of San Francisco. These are. The biggest one, of course, is Salesforce Tower. What a great building. And living on my hill is the best place to get a view of it. Now we're coming up on a building and we're now on Buena Vista East. So we're on the backside of Buena Vista Park, right? Coming up in front of us is a building with a rich history, bad and good. It's 181 Buena Vista East. Now this building was owned by the same family who built it until the matriarch died. She was very old and she lived in this house alone. 181 Buena Vista East. The only person who ever visited her was her gardener, and he didn't come all that often. One day he came by, he knocked, she didn't answer. He went inside and he realized that she had been dead for three days. She had been murdered, yes. So he called the police, and of course, the police arrested him because they thought he was the prime suspect. Here it is, 181 Buena Vista East with a great tower and a great view behind it to downtown San Francisco. So they let the gardener go, and they couldn't figure out who killed the matriarch. Well, her son, who didn't live in San Francisco, made a big mistake. He called up the attorney, and he said, when do I get my inheritance? I really need the money. So guess who became the chief suspect? Her son. And it turned out that her son had flown into town the morning that she was killed and flown out of town that night. How suspicious is that? Unfortunately, all the evidence was circumstantial and they never pinned it on. Here we are at 181 Buena Vista East. Well, after that family sold it, guess who moved in? None other than James Hormel. That's right, James Hormel of Hormel Chile. Look at this great house. Hormel also made Spam. Can you imagine how rich he is and how much money he inherited? But he was a good businessman. He ran the company. 
and he married a woman he loved, and he had two children that he adored. But in the middle of his life, he decided it was time to be gay. So he still loved his wife, but he divorced her and stayed friends. And he stayed friends with his children, and he became a gay man with his husband in that beautiful house. And he's a wonderful benefactor to gay organizations. Isn't that great? He even gives money to Theodore Rhinoceros. What a good guy. And remember when Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton, the president, made him the ambassador to Luxembourg? That was great. And everybody was so upset because he was gay. How ridiculous. Luxembourg is tiny. Who cares? Anyway, Bill Clinton pushed it on through because Bill Clinton wanted to support this wonderful gay man. This wonderful gay man, James Hormel, who lived in that terrific house. Now here on our right is another big skyscraper apartment building. And you might recognize this as being the brother of the one on the other side because it's got the exact same architect. Yes, it's the so I wonder if Armistone has another lover there, somebody he can keep an eye on all the way over from Edgewood. I love this building because it's got this great art deco entrance. There's a goddess over the door. Imagine coming home having had a rough day at work and you enter under this goddess. This goddess, who I'm sure blesses you when you come home. Look at this. Look at this entrance with this wonderful goddess on top of it. There she is. Right above the entry. A terrific goddess to bless you every night. Now let's look at the lobby, because the lobby is something out of New York City. I just love this. Look at that lobby. It's like a Chrysler building lobby. What a great place to come home to. Bauman sure knew how to build apartment buildings. He knew his stuff. So now we're going to come back down to Haight Street. And we have completely ridden around Buena Vista Park. How exciting is that? And there in front of us, looking kind of small from this angle, is once again San Ignatius, the Italian hill town on the next mountain over. So we're coming back down to Haight Street the lifeline of the hate Ashbury. So our play opened and it was a big hit. Everybody loved it. It was great. And our big producer who didn't give us the $5,000 came to opening night and he loved it. And I thought, wow, this guy's got bucks. Maybe he'll give me some. Maybe he'll let me write and direct a movie. Maybe Denzel will star in it. Yes, maybe Bob Dylan will write a song about it. This will be great. He said he loved my work. Loved it, loved it, loved it. And he didn't say another word. In other words, absolutely nothing came of it. I'd been intimidated by Hollywood, in love with Hollywood. I'd gone down to Hollywood with my calling card production to become a writer director of blockbuster movies. And I even got a big producer to come see it. And he didn't even want to talk to me about a project. Wow. We're now coming up on a street called Lion Street. It's spelled L-Y-O-N. Now that probably should be pronounced Lyon, but in San Francisco, we say Lyon. My father grew up in Alameda. They had a street called Versailles Street, but he, he, he said that if anybody ever said Versailles Street in Alameda, they wouldn't know what they're talking about. So you had to say Versailles Street. So this is Lyon Street in San Francisco. We're turning right down Lyon Street. Now, a young lady lived here during the summer of love, 1966. She came from Port Arthur, Texas, and she never fit in Port Arthur. Everybody in her town hated her. People in high school made fun of her. People in college didn't understand her. They thought she was weird. So she left college, and she moved to the Haight-Ashbury because she wanted to be a singer. And she was a great singer when she got here during the summer of love. Everybody loved her. But... She went from using casual drugs like marijuana and LSD to using heroin and amphetamines. She went for the hard stuff and it scared the heck out of her. So she fled back to Texas because she was afraid of drugs and she didn't like the fact that she started using drugs in the hate Ashbury. Then a music producer followed her to Texas and he said, you gotta come back to the hate and sing. 
She said, I'm afraid of the drugs. I'm afraid that I can't sing as well as I do without being on the drugs. Her name was Janice Joplin. And here's the house she lived in when she was in the Haight-Ashbury. Right here on Lyon Street. You see it? That's where Janice Joplin lived. And she performed across the street in the Panhandle, which you can see there, at the Love Pageant Valley. That was on October 6th, 1966, to celebrate the legalization of LSD. Well, she didn't want to go back to the Hay Ashbury because she was afraid of using drugs again. And she was afraid of heroin. But the music producer convinced her that she should come back to San Francisco. Her first night in that apartment, she walked in and there were a lot of people in there and they were getting ready to shoot up heroin. And she totally freaked out. She was horrified because she didn't want to get back on the drugs. They put it all away. Now she always said, Janice Joplin, that her favorite audiences were in San Francisco. Those are the audiences that she loved best because they were counterculture. They understood her music. They understood her. They were appreciative. Unfortunately, the people who handled her didn't think they could make enough money in San Francisco. There wasn't enough money here. So they sent her on the road. And she went out on the road, which she didn't like. She didn't like the audiences as much. She got depressed and she ended up back on heroin and drinking a lot. To get away from it all, she bought a house in Larkspur, California, near where I went to high school, Redwood High. Isn't that amazing? That's also where Robin Williams went to high school. And Gavin Newsom, what fun is that? I never saw her in Larkspur. The funny thing about Janis Joplin is, I never liked her music. And I think it's because I never saw her perform. But in preparing this piece, I saw her on YouTube. And I have to say that seeing her on YouTube live, a real performer, I thought she was amazing. It was like I was saying last week about Vermeer. There's some artists that you can enjoy just from books. Then when you see the real paintings, you enjoy them even more. But Vermeer is an artist you have to see in person. That's what I discovered about Janice Joplin. You gotta see her. She is great. What a performer. I'm now a Janice Joplin fan. Unfortunately, she got very lonely on the road and she had to go to Los Angeles to record. Remember, Jerry Garcia didn't like recording in San Francisco. Too many stairs to haul his equipment up. So she was recording a new album in Los Angeles and she got very lonely. And her fiance, Seth Morgan, who would write a book called Homeboy, forgot to call her that night. And her best friend forgot to call her too. And she got so lonely that she overdosed on heroin and drank too much and died in Los Angeles alone. Well, our next story was probably the most famous story from the 70s that's local. In 1974, Patricia Hurst, Patty Hurst, was kidnapped from UC Berkeley by the Symbionese Liberation Army. The Symbionese Liberation Army's field marshal was a man named Sin Q. Now this was an amazing kidnapping because the ransom was the most provocative ransom I've ever heard in my life. This ransom was amazing. The Symbionese Liberation Army insisted that the Hearsts spend $400,000 on growing the poor. How provocative a ransom. Isn't that incredible? And I remember on TV, poor people lining up to get food. Isn't that the most amazing thing? I remember a woman saying, I'm really sorry for Patty Hearst and her family. This is awful, but I really need the groceries. Well, when they first kidnapped her, they brought her to a safe house in San Francisco. A safe house is a place where the FBI and the police will never find you. And they put her in a closet. This is the first safe house they put her in, 
It's one, two, three, five, Masonic. There it is. And this is where she was put in a closet by the Simonese Liberation Army. It's a beautiful Victorian building. And it was the first, eventually this safe house got discovered by the police. So they had to move her to another safe house on Golden Gate Avenue, not far from here. 17 days into her captivity, Patty Hearst was brainwashed by the SLA. They have tapes of her spouting their philosophies. The Stockholm Syndrome. She'd been brainwashed by her captors and she participated in a famous robbery of the Hibernia Bank on Noriega in the Richmond district. Unfortunately, two men were shot during the robberies. It was bad. So the Simonese Liberation Army had to leave San Francisco. They fled south to Inglewood in the Los Angeles area. There they were run to ground by the FBI and the police department and in a massive shootout, a bunch of them were killed along with their field marshal, Sin Q. Patty and the Harrises fled north and ended up in another safe house, another part of the city. And there she was found by the FBI with her friend, Wendy. They put her on trial as an accessory to murder because of the two men who got shot at Hibernia Bank robbery. How about that? We're coming up on another house of another famous rock and roll star. This man is considered one of the greatest rock and roll musicians of all time, Jimi Hendrix. He came to the Haight-Ashbury to do music during the summer of love. One thing I didn't know about him is that he was in the 101st Airborne Division. He was an elite airborne person, but he discovered when he was in the Airborne Division that he wanted to make music. He didn't want to be a paratrooper. So here's his house, the Jimi Hendrix Red House at 1524 Street. There you see it. It's a beautiful three-story Victorian. Jimi Hendrix House. Jimi Hendrix is another one. I never appreciated him until I started preparing this piece and then I watched him on YouTube. What a great performer. I never loved his recordings, but I love watching him. Unfortunately, he went the same way as Janis Joplin. 17 days before she OD'd on heroin, he OD'd on heroin in London and died. Both of them were 27 years old. How sad is that? Amazing. Two performers who you have to see because they are magic when you see them. Meanwhile, my show in LA was getting all these agents coming to see it, dozens of them. But they weren't looking for writer directors, they were looking for actors. And every night they'd show up and paw through all the headshots we gave them, looking for the actors. No producers came to see my show. And I thought, well, this is sad. The whole reason I came down here was to have a calling card so I can make it in movies as a writer director. But none of them showed up. Woody Allen's agent had seen the show, and he said he loved it. He even got a good gig for me in Aspen, but he was retired, and he really didn't have the energy to take on a new project. So there were no surprises. I came back to San Francisco and started working on another play, a big, huge play, and it was reviewed in Variety magazine. And immediately, I got a call from Hollywood, even though I was back here. Unfortunately, the person who called me wanted me to write for television. And I said, well, I don't watch your show, but I'll watch it and bone up. But my heart wasn't in it. And that was the offer I got to write for TV. The next house was the home of a man who came to the Haight-Ashbury because he too wanted to be a musician. And he brought his girlfriend here. Well, they set up in this little house on Cole Street. And he really struggled to become a musician. But he also got into the heavier drugs. He started out with marijuana and LSD. And eventually, he was using heroin, just like Janis Joplin. So he got into the hard stuff. And he lived here, right here, at 626 
Coal Street. And his name was Charles Manson. And his girlfriend's name was Squeaky Frome. Now, my friend Peggy lived right across the street. And she and I used to shout out the window at the people on the street having fun. And the whole time, we had no idea that 20 years before we were shouting out the street, Charles Manson had lived right here on Cole Street. Now, Charles Manson was very frustrated with his inability to get started as a musician in the Haight-Ashbury. So he packed up and he took his family of characters, including Squeaky Frome and all these people, disciples, he gathered around him and moved to Topanga Canyon to an unused Hollywood set where they lived in the Los Angeles area. And eventually he ordered his family to execute, kill Sharon Tate and her house guests in the famous Tate murder. Joan Didion wrote probably the most famous essay about the hate Ashbury, slouching towards Bethlehem. But she didn't like the hate. She thought that the drugs had ruined it. She was here during the heroin era. And she said that the 60s ended with the killing of Sharon Tate and her house guests in the Polanski house in the Hollywood Hills. I once heard somebody say the 60s really was just 1966 and a little bit of 67. And the rest of it was just residue. But the magic is still here. It's incredible. And it trumps any magic of any neighborhood in Los Angeles. That's what I discovered. Just by stepping out my back door and exploring my hill, I found a hill as magical as anything in Los Angeles. We're coming up in our last house. And in front of me, you'll see rising above gloriously. There it is again, San Ignatius. And there it is on its own little hill right in front of us. My little hill town. Like magic, this place. Do you see it? Right there in the distance. It just keeps popping up. LA doesn't have hill towns. Not like us. You have to go to Italy to get ones this good. So this last house is kind of complicated because there have been a lot of discussions about who and what and how. I'll just say this. A woman named Kathleen, who was a very famous writer in the 20th century, lived in this house. She was very successful. Her granddaughter married the father of my brother-in-law. My brother-in-law and my sister-in-law are both Romanovs. And Kathleen was the grandmother, great-grandmother, of my brother-in-law. Now, the woman that her granddaughter married was Andrew Romanov of the Romanov dynasty. The Romanovs fled Russia after the communists killed Tsar Nicholas I. And Andrew is a direct heir to the Romanov dynasty. How about that? And here is where his famous mother-in-law lived. Grandmother-in-law, excuse me. Kathleen lived in this house and she was a writer. And because her daughter married Andrew, we call him Big Andrew, I am now the brother-in-law of Little Andrew. Little Andrew, Little Andrew, my brother-in-law could one day be czar. And if he is, I could go with Michael, my husband, and dance in a huge waltz scene at the Winter Palace. How much fun would that be? Yes, indeed. But then Putin would have to give the Winter Palace back to the Romanovs. So what did I learn? I learned that Hollywood doesn't really have anything on San Francisco, not even my little mountain. And I also learned that some very evil things happen in LA. Think of it, three of our stories that started in San Francisco ended horribly there. Patty Hearst and the SLA and that awful shootout in Inglewood. Charles Manson and Squeaky Frome ordering the execution of Sharon Tate in the Hollywood Hills, and finally, dear old Janice Joplin dying in that awful little hotel, trying to make it as a recording artist because she had to be in LA because that's where all the recording happened. It's so sad. Now, evil things have happened in San Francisco, but those evil things, I don't know. They tarnished LA for me. I used to be intimidated by it, but now not so much anymore. Through a combination of understanding some of the evil stories that ended there, and also through discovering in my own backyard a delightful place, every bit as magical as a Hollywood hill.
So here I am, back in the Haight-Ashbury, next to my library. This is my library. It's the Parkside branch. Look around, nobody coming. I'm gonna pull my mask down again. Thank you for joining me in my exploration of my neighborhood, the Haight-Ashbury. How much fun was this for me? It was great. I'm John Fisher, and I've been doing um, COVID-19 presentations for every week of Shelter in Place. This is my 21st. And I couldn't do it without you guys coming along with me. So thank you so much for being my audience. If you'd like to make a donation to our theater in these trying times, we'd certainly appreciate it. And it would help us continue all of this free programming that we've been doing. But more than anything, we love you just being here. So here's the address if you want to make a donation, therhino.org. That's T-H-E-R-H-I-N-O.org. Or you can mail it to me in my office or I'm working during COVID-19. John Fisher, Theater Rhinoceros, 91 Central Avenue, number 102, San Francisco, California, 94117. And that's my address on the mountain of Buena Vista Park with all those great movie stars and politicians, and literary figures and musicians all over it. I'm so proud of it. Yes, indeed. It's a great hill to live on, better than anything in Hollywood. So, I'm going to ride home to my husband, and I hope you guys have a lovely evening. Thank you again so much for joining me for exercise, exploration at night of the Walk o Death and my wonderful hill full of so many wonderful people and such great architecture. Good night.